I'm the creature designer for Underworld. Basically, my task is usually to design early on, have the guys start building up the creature, supervise it with them, and have a great team on the back of people. And um, 10 years of uh, work together make you be able to do things like that when one person concentrates on one type of work and the other guys work on the fabrication, let's say. I, I first met Patrick when I was on Stargate, working as a prop guy. And I just, I fell in love with his his design work, and I saw a lot of his drawings uh, in, the, in the production, uh, in the art department at the time. And just his uh, just obsession with, with, with detail and uh, just the kind of designs that he was doing, I just, I just fell in love with. And From the beginning, Len also wanted Patrick to topple us. Uh, he had worked with Patrick, admired Patrick. Uh, they're both artists, they're both gifted artists. They had an easy way of communication. Um, Patrick wanted the werewolves to be sexy. And, you know, that was, uh, he, he pulled it off. Okay, what you've got behind me is the design of the werewolf. This is what we started with. I did a few concepts before. Some were actually a lot more wolf-like, some were more like uh, cat-like. I really wanted to combine the concept of using practical creatures, guys in suits, but then combine it with the wire work that, that we have today. And just being able to get the, the movement to make a werewolf be able to bound down a hallway or flip from one wall to the next, that you don't necessarily need to use CG to do that. And I think that that's been a big push. I mean, when, I, when we were going around pitching this idea for Underworld, I did really want everybody to know that I wanted to get back to uh, just, just doing practical creatures. I wanted a guy in a, in a suit. And I, I, you know, we, we referenced, uh, we, we brought in footage actually of uh, like, you know, Alien or Aliens and um, Pumpkinhead or The Predator. And I just think that there's something that you just, that you get from a guy in a suit. And I wanted to bring that back. I never really saw that that was going wrong. And a lot of, a lot of the movies now have gone CG where I thought that we, we, we were actually getting better with the prosthetics. So I, I really wanted to just bring that back. There's always difficulties, you know, when you create suits and things like that, full body suits and create leg extension like we've done for those actors to walk on. First of all, every time you create new, we, we've been developing those leg extension for the guys to walk like wolves. Every time you do new sets of leg extension, you try to R&D a little more and make them more interesting than the last set. The last pair we've done was for Godzilla years back. Uh, they did the job, but I felt they were lacking a lot of articulation. Now, technology has has got better, and this time we have a set of werewolf legs which are much more organic and realistic. You always try to find new approaches toward tried and true techniques. We've been fortunate enough to get a, an artist that we like to work with, Steve Wang, who's done a lot of suit work in the past. Steve brought a lot of neat ideas that we hadn't played with before, so kind of creating a marriage between all departments and probably getting a little crazy in some of the techniques, we, we tried to bring the best things that everyone had to offer into the suits as far as isolating muscle groups, integrating all the hair work and color work. Um, and I think ultimately it's just, you just try to take things that have been done before and improve upon them. We have uh, Chris and Jim working on painting the hero body, and uh, this is a, a foam rubber suit. It's just made of foam latex. He's very flexible here. And the actors will actually wear this costume with the leg extensions. After the heads are painted in the suits, you know, they come here to the hair department. And what uh, Phil's doing here is he's taking the yak hair and he's punching them in individually, one at a time, into the head. And we're sealing it with a little bit of silicone so the hair will stay in much longer. Uh, this is quite a laborious process because, um, as you can see, you know, each individual hair has to be put in separately. But when, when we're done, the results are quite fantastic. I, I came to Patrick and said, I, I, I really don't want a lot of hair for these werewolves because I actually want to see the structure. I'd seen a lot of stuff that just, um, you know, phases of different creatures being built or you look at other werewolves and, and you see the actual um, definition in, in, in just the, the muscles. And then you put a bunch of hair all over it and, and all that's lost, especially when you light it and it's in the dark and all that, that's all gone. It was something you could see musculature, you could see the mottled skin, you could see the pores. It's something that was very distinct because, after all, a werewolf is half man. And just wanted like the, everything to, from the face. I didn't really want that long nose snout thing that we had seen. I wanted something different. Uh, Patrick was, was uh, really into the idea of making something a bit more cat-like. 
And so that, that's the direction that, that we went, is just um, something where you actually saw a bit more of the muscle tone and more like a pit bull even. What Kurt's wearing is just the head and animatronic vest that's part of the werewolf costume. He also would potentially have on leg extensions, which raise his height up as well. As we look at the animatronic head, um, go ahead and take us through some mouth movements, Kat. He has a full range of lip movement, muzzle movement, jaw opens up, and then for the eye and head array, you have blinks, you have brow movement, you have full up and down eye movement in both axes, and that all kind of works together. So if he was going to do a big roar, we might give him something like this, roar, and then bring it out. Um, the big servos that drive the jaw cable back, and that's what he's wearing here. To work the jaw for us. He also has two banks of servos that do various functions as far as the lip pulls, um, muzzle, that sort of stuff. And then down here is this whole little mess of uh, receivers. He's got three different radios that drive him. The battery pack usually lives up here in the costume. He also has a comm link that allows the lead puppeteer to speak to him so they can cue roars, cues to camera, that kind of stuff. And conceptually, the, the hybrid was probably one of the most difficult things to design. We were actually stressed about it quite a bit because you, you want, you know, it is half vampire and half werewolf, but a lot of, of just mixing that together, you get a little bit of a Buffy the Vampire Slayer thing. We didn't really want to go there. I, I actually, I, I did one, one drawing early on, and, and uh, I brought it to Patrick, and I, I, I knew what I wanted. I wanted this guy that was just, his whole face was just covered with, with like really, really fine hairs. I mean, the eyelids, the lips, everything. I had never seen that before. I just wanted full, just, just head to toe, little fine for that. I, I, I told him like, like, the, like the nose hair on a, on a cat. He loved the drawing, he said that's fantastic, but the only way to do that is this process called flocking, which you have to, I guess, just use some kind of like, you have to basically put like electricity in, inside the person's body to, to have this flocking stick to the skin. Because he had done work, I, I believe, on, on Stuart Little. And he had built these little mice that, that had that same type of, of small hair. But this, he, did, he had never done it on a human. And he said that it was, I guess it's a, it's a I, think, I think it's just an impossible process and, and a dangerous process to do. And we, we finally settled on something that was the giving the human the texture and skin of a werewolf and giving the coloring. So the, all, the, all the modeling and everything was the actual skin that you'd see on the werewolf minus a lot of the hair. And a lot of the fine detail and everything in the texture of, of the skin. Some of the, like where the, where the elbows and, and just the, the shoulders and everything bend, it feels almost like, like elephant skin. And that's where we end up going, just changing the musculature up a little bit, changing the cheekbones and all that kind of thing. And that's where we ended up going with, with, uh, with the hybrid in, in the end. We'd, we'd come up with, uh, with the idea of these silver nitrate bullets, so we needed to show the effects of how that was actually affecting the lichens. We, we tried regular makeup effects. We went through things that felt a bit more kind of cakey and, and sort of uh, you know, painted on, these, where, where the silver looked like it was actually affecting the veins and the person's skin. After going through all these different test phases and, and putting them on camera and they would, they would, they would show them to me, the, the one that looked the most realistic was one that was done with an airbrush and it was just a very painstaking process where they would paint on these, these veins. And we would take that as our kind of final element and then use CG to actually start the process and have the veins work over the, over the skin and start to, to blotch and, and just become darker. And that would all be done in CG and then we would match that with our practical effect. Fabrication was done at a rapid pace. It was, it was mind-boggling. Len and I would drop down there, one day they'd be molding clay, three days later they'd be pulling a foam plug out. What we do is we sit an actor down, we put a bald cap on him, and what that does is kind of cleans the canvas for us. Then an impression cream called alginate is poured over the head. That's an amazing uh, material that picks up every detail, every wrinkle, every pore. It's an excellent precision uh, molding compound. Into that we pour plaster, which this is right here. This is our actor Bill. He's getting ready to be molded. We put in our keys, elongate the cast, and get it ready for a silicone mold. What do you think of these doubles? I love you. 
I love him. I like him even more than I like myself, which is not a big stretch, but. So to create uh, the relatively big bodysuit, we took our actor and again put him in the stance that we knew that we needed. And with the dental impression cream again, we poured it all over his body. Whoa! At that point, the plaster bandage goes on to reinforce that and wooden struts to give it some real strength. We're able to split that along a half line, open it on up, and into that we put our resin compound that gets reinforced with fiberglass. The idea is when you're working with a shape this big, anything really over a head and shoulders, it's nice to go to lightweight materials so that you could work as aggressively as you need and not, you know, be worrying about getting a hernia. I found that in my pants. I don't know quite what that is. But this okay. is uh, I wouldn't tell you what that is. But. Victor, being the main vampire, has many stages of makeup that he goes through from his initial phase where we see him uh, coming out of his casket. And then we slowly start to see him sort of reconstitute as they pump him full of blood and vampire reconstitution stuff. And he has two phases of makeup there until we finally see him in his final fully restored form. Somebody came up to me and said, so there's a kind of zip up the back, is there? And you go, no, there's no zip here. You know, you, this is, you know, I'm truly in this that stuff. Your need of rest. I've rested enough. Patrick Totopoulos and Guy Hamber were so enthusiastic about this project from day one. Their talent and the love they felt for this project just is in everything that you see on screen.